Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke saying hi, and this video is about a hardware discussion relationship. Are you ready to make the big jump and go to a real power station that involves Xeon? As in the processors themselves. The Xeon processor is pretty awesome, and when you're looking at an i5 or an i7 or an i9, central processor, basically a core processor that would be used for PCs, you think in a different way. But when you start thinking in the sense of a Xeon environment, you can ask yourself, hey, you know, is this the time? And what am I looking for? And that's a great question because the reality of the fact is, if you think you're ready and you want to move up to a Xeon, then you have to have two core things. One, a good featured motherboard and two a need that's right don't get a Xeon if you play a game um, get a Xeon if you're running a server in the background it's doing stack collections and it's actually acting and doing supplement services for you while you play your game and maybe two or three other things that is where a Xeon's shine for instance, like video compiling stat in real time while you're getting all the gaming time you want. And of course, in the background, you have a server on the back end that's doing some additional calculations and computations for the actions and transactions you're doing on your gaming session. That is where you can get into a workstation for a user that can do all the things you do with a normal processor stack, such as an i7 but you've got a lot more resources at your disposal, a true power user. Now, it is true, a Xeon motherboard is designed specifically to do server kind of roles. Server basically means to serve others, opposed to itself, unlike a personal PC, which is just strictly focused on performance of its single task. So what kind of motherboard would do this that would fit in your PC tower? Well, the truth is, it's pretty easy. There are many ATXs out there in ATXs that would fit in a normal case. Um, there is no real difference between that and other standard motherboards. Let me give you an example. This is a standard Xeon old series style motherboard. It used to be a Dell 300. And if you look here, you'll notice that it has exactly the same kind of mounting points as some of the other motherboards that are out there such as this basic i5 motherboard here that fits in a standard pc now most pc standard mid-sized towers will easily accommodate something like this now this xeon motherboard is just a single xeon here it's an older generational one but it is a xeon and it has some limitations to it because you know it's a single processor so this is one of the key challenges if you're going to go into the world of Xeon power workstations, having a single Xeon doesn't get you very much. It really doesn't. It's just a hyper variation of a standalone platform. What you really want to do is to consider doing what we call a dual processing setup or an SMP dual processor motherboard. You've seen this several times on, on my channel. Most of my servers are dual processors. I have a couple that are dual processors that only have one Xeon. So because of that, um, you know, it's still a standalone workstation. It's just one processor and it can't do much. So if you were to go up to the world of a true powerhouse workstation, then go with two processors. The formats don't really change. The board doesn't get much bigger. It's just shared a little differently and designed a little differently. The other thing about this, again, you know, when you look at motherboards, you'll notice something very common about many of them. Just like standard motherboards have a single processor, you also find that many of them may only have four DIMM sockets. And to get a dual SMP motherboard with just two slots per processor is not a good idea. So what you want to do is you want to get an SMP motherboard. And there are many, many, many out there that are very cheap. And they're in, let's say, the 8th generational level. And they'll, you'll find that they only have four DIMM slots in them. And they're really not that valuable. Because the amount of money you got to spend for that single DIMM that's huge is just cost prohibitive. What you want to get is a dual S&P motherboard with 8 minimum, 16 maximum slots. 
a lot of times you'll find that they'll have 12 slots on them. And that's okay too. That would work. Now the other thing, if you're going to be in a full tower or a mid-sized tower, and I would recommend that when you go to a Xeon platform, understand that you also may want to consider the fact of how many slots you have available and some of the advanced functionalities of them. PCIe 2 is recommended. So don't go anything older than that unless you really want to get into like AGP as you see here. The AGP is not the same as PCI 3 6, X16 as you see here. So with a Xeon motherboard, you do a little research. The Super Micro motherboards are really great about this and I use one myself and uh, on the version 4 of the Xeon family. If you go to the power station of a more than just a basic user kind of footprint, you want to make sure that you've got that cohesion that you're looking for. And in this particular case, that cohesion is about dual processors, the dual 64-bit lanes, which allow you to do a lot of stack processing. You're going to be able to segment your PCIe bus if you're going in that direction, or PCIe and PC, PCIe. Sometimes you'll have both on board. And you also have 8 to 12 or 8 to 16 dim sockets. And believe it or not, when you actually do this, uh, now the world starts to open up. You can run a 32 gig gaming session on X4000 while you've got your matrix stack status report services running in the background. All your email, all the other things you can exp experience with a personal PC is in the background as well. You can even start compiling videos and let those eat up a certain amount of processors while you're still enjoying a great game of X4 5 Foundation. May it be even real time. The key thing, the key ideal about this is I just share that you're working with a footprint that is really flexible. Now, with that, the question is, okay, what if I have two X16s on my motherboard for my Xeon? Should I go dual processing for, for GPU? Well, the truth of the matter is, no, don't do that. The reason why is go with a single better ported GPU. Let's say something between a seven, I'm sorry, correction, a GeForce 2080 or a 3080. I wouldn't go any higher than that. 2080s would be fine. A lot of good resources in regards to how that would work. So I think if you look at that capacity, uh, with multiple back stack ports, you can do many displays. That's not an issue. But the reason why I'm suggesting that you have a GPU, one GPU, on board on a single X16, is that will allow you to do NVMe in the clear. That's valuable. NVMe is a very powerful high bandwidth capacity for storage. But it's very limited, too. The more you try to put on your motherboard, the worse the performance of the NVMe gets. It is a hog. It really is. So if you have a GPU on your one PCIe bus, then put your NVMe on the second PCIe bus, which will be going to the other processor. By doing that, you're going to have the ability of taking maximum bandwidth capacity across your dual processor stacks. And that really is, gives you a very, very good performance level. Now, with that being said, your server motherboard most likely will also have what we call, I'm sorry, correction, your Xeon dual processor motherboard could be a, de a high performance desktop board or it could be a server standardized ATX board. It will most likely have on board as well a SAS slash SATA RAID controller or an HBA controller on board. Now this is very important. A lot of you guys come at me with the fact that when you think about SATA, you think that you're getting a very functional controller that can let you detect all types of interfaces that are connectable to it, including SAS. The truth of the fact is that is not correct at all. The real fact is that these are very basic SATA disk controllers. Now this one does have a limited RAID functionality where you can have two drives set in a RAID and then the rest are just standalone devices. Um, but they're all the same way. When you look here, you see the same kind of setup. Again, the same kind of setup. In the older days, SATA was much more baseline. It was more of the capacity of 1, 1, and then 1 ultra high 6G. 
or something like that. But the key detail, unlike a server motherboard, you'll discover very quickly that the RAID functionality controller on a server quality or a Xeon quality motherboard is a lot higher. And you can go after hard disks such as you know, 15,000 RPM SAS disks, which are fairly cheap out there on eBay, and you can do those as an archival kind of configuration. So what does that basically mean in a nutshell for you? Well, if you get a newer motherboard that has the SAS SATA controllers on board, uh, you'll be able to connect directly to the motherboard and have some li limited but capacity to say, let's say up to about, I would say six or eight drives, okay? If you have a segmented controller setup where you have NVMe on the motherboard, then you'll lose two of those drives. You'll have six that you can work with and that's still good. So you've got one NVMe drive, and then you've got six SAS drives that are 15,000 RPM, and they're four terabytes each. That's plenty of capacity for you video editors out there, right? And cache editors and streaming editors and so on and so on. So that's a very powerful system. Now, one other thing you can also do, and please understand that this is a trick. So when you're dealing with Xeon motherboards and you put a dual NVMe paired RAID 1 card on your PCIe bus, you're not getting two high-speed NVMEs at all. Nope, sorry. You're getting a RAID controller with a cache buffer. Everything that the NVMEs does behind the RAID controller is strictly there on the card. Everything is funneled through the RAID controller, no different than any other stack. And so the only performance you really get is the NVME equivalency of one drive off the card itself. Let me explain. The, when you put two NVMe cards on board a RAID controller card so you can run it in redundant configuration because there is a risk because memory drives don't just die, they die. Unlike spinning disks, so you could kind of recover some data. Not really the case with memory drives. So with that being said, you can put two NVMe cards, uh, uh, storage cards on a single controller card and they're on the back side and then you'll see a controller chip in the middle you might see some memory and then on the front end it goes right into the bus of the pci but it only presents the front end of the controller bandwidth wise for the controller chipset it owns the bandwidth and it will only give you the speed of a single nvme drive where you're saying well wait a minute i got two nvmes here they should be screaming together raid five i should see more capacity. I'm sorry, RAID, RAID 1 capacity. I said, no, that's not the case. The case is every time you add more NVMe drives on top of a single PCIe bus, your divider of performance is by two. That's right. That's why when you see these cool cards that have got four, eight, and whatever amount of NVMe cards on them, they're not performing equal to that of a single NVMe card. So, understand that detriment effect so be careful with that but it's actually perfectly okay to put an nvme card on a motherboard just one and then you can take a portion of that and snapshot it over to your sas or sata drives so that you have redundancy happening every other day or so snapshot policies i'll talk about that later but with that being said uh, it is really valuable to understand um, that when you want to go to xeon then do Xeon right. A little bit more research. eBay has thousands of dual C CPU, 7th, 8th, ninth generational processor boards that are really great performance boards. They will crunch like crazy and they're designed to do that to give you the things that you're looking for and still be a workstation that's a gaming station and so on and so on. Now, the last part of this discussion is premised on the fact that when we're talking about Xeon motherboards, I'm ready to rock and roll with Windows 11, or I still have Windows 10, or some other variation of Windows. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Windows 11, Windows 10, will not truly take advantage of your configuration. When you have a lot of RAM, and you have a lot of cores, and you have a lot of processing power, it's more geared for the single processor platform environment. So what do I mean by that? Well, the truth of the matter is Windows 11 is the standardized industry standard baseline operating system for baseline deployments. Baseline deployments are PCs. 
They have usually limited resources, marginal processors, a GPU or two, and that's it. The key detail about these motherboards is that they're the introductional baseline's design. Now that to you means basically in a nutshell that as long as you have so many resources, let's say a quad core or an eight core or something like that, and you've got two or four memory sticks on board and you can go up to six, let's say 32 or 64 gigs, then um, Windows 11 is okay. You know, it does pretty decently. But there seem to be some restrictions that do occur a lot, a lot specifically with your higher bandwidth requirements, such as networking. Like if you want to put in a 2.5 gigahertz configuration for, I'm sorry, 2.5 gig, uh, network gigabit uh, infrastructure connection. So what happens there is you start to realize and start to hit the wall of, of Microsoft's Windows. What do I recommend instead? Well, what I would recommend to you is to investigate when you start to set aside the hardware to build this workstation, investigate Linux. Linux actually can take full advantage and bring that computer down to a crawl of the processing of the RAM of 10 gigabit architectures at 2.5 gigabit architectures for networking for an entourage of different storage resources and so on and so on. But Linux is a learning curve. I have done Unix. I've done SCO way back in the day. That's a long time ago. Um, I've done pretty much even BEOS. Yeah, that's that's down in the days where, well, right after OS2, if you guys know anything about OS2. Um, Linux is a good way to go, but it's not for the lighthearted. It is for the power station guru, the guy who wants to really crunch. And all the tools that are in Microsoft are out there in free state with Linux. I know that because I use them myself to do these very videos you see. So I'll be playing a game, I'll be crunching a uh, Kiban style video process and so on and so on and so on on a system that's using 194 gigs and 48 cores and so on. And I got my virtual engines running in the background while I'm running my virtual processes stacks. And uh, I'm also doing a snapshot in the background that's backing up my system to make sure it's healthy, wealthy, and wise. But you see what I'm saying? I'm putting an operating system on there that can truly bring all that firepower to bear. So with that being said, I'm going to be signing off here. I hope you guys have some fun with this. That's the key detail, having fun. And it doesn't hurt to have a small laptop that could be any basic OS, Chrome or Windows or whatever. Have it on the sideline. So if you have to do something that you're more familiar, familiar with with Windows or Chrome, you can do that on the laptop to prep you and to build out your Linux station. Uh, I found that to be very valuable, especially when you start to learn the basics about recovery and things like that. Well, anyways, God bless. Have a great week and take care.